Uh, my name is Mazlina. I am with the Education for Sustainable Development Program of WWF Malaysia. And for those who have just joined us, please check out the chat box for the house rules and also our Slido link to where you can pop the questions that you have for our expert speakers later during the session and also for our program booklet for your reference. Now, in the previous two sessions, we have heard you, our um, storytellers, shared about the impact of climate change, both on the global level and also on um, in our own backyards. Um, we have also heard about how we could protect ourselves and what we can do to mitigate the impact of climate change um, individually and beyond that. So in this particular session, we are going to look at youth empowerment and how youth can play an active role in the, in the uh, environmental um, activism, being informed and um, just driving environmental change. We'll also look at how we can move forward as a community. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome um, our first speaker for today, Fong Seng Jun from Tenby School, City Eco Park. Um, the floor is yours, Seng Jun. Thank you, Miss. Where do you picture yourself in 18 months? Some of us will be preparing to embrace our new college life, while others have an image of reinvention on their bucket list. But where's the driving factor that motivates all of us to strive for a different outcome? The answer is simple. The goal to move forward and be greeted by a brighter future. But what if I told you that you might not have the chance to do so? That the choice of what you do next isn't relying on your financial status, your career path, or even your ability to carry out that task. That your future was dependent on the fate of the earth. Good afternoon, everyone. And what a pleasure it is to be here today. My name is Fong Sing Jun and I'm from Tenby School, Sadeika Park. Today, I'll be discussing how the youth can make an informed decision and advocate for environmental policy. Prince Charles said, and I quote, I am firmly of the view that the next 18 months will decide our ability to keep climate change to survivable levels and to restore nature to the equilibrium we need for our survival. Over the past few years, we have seen a shift in the environmental and physical state of our planet, from the Amazon wildfires to the Indonesian floods. There are many climate disasters happening all over the globe. They haven't stopped and they won't anytime soon. There are many victims of the drastic effects of climate change, and this is just one of them. A nation filled with low-lying islands and atolls located in the Pacific Ocean is the Marshall Islands with all of them being less than six feet in elevation. Due to the geographic and topographic situation of these islands, they are placed in a position of intense risk in terms of exposure to the drastic effects of climate change. The sea level rise has already encroached landwards and high tides and frequent storms continue to threaten local homes and properties. Recent research indicates that sea levels have been rising by 3.4 millimeters per year. This means that a one meter rise could result in the loss of 80% of the Majaru Atoll, which is home to half of the entire population. As of September 2019, another disastrous climate event has struck up, the Australian bushfires. One study showed that between September 2019 and January 2020, around 5.8 million hectares of broadleaf forests were burned in New South Wales and Victoria. This accounts for roughly 20% of the nation's entire forested area, making this fire season proportionately the most devastating on record. Professor Chris Dickman, an expert on Australian biodiversity at the University of Sydney, estimated that as many as 480 million animals, maybe even more, have been killed in the wildfires. Who are we to not bat an eye 
to the devastation that has rained upon all of us. Who are we to sit idly by and not fight for all of our lives? We are the cause and we are to blame. How much we have lost puts us to shame. The lives of many are at stake. To take up the fight is never too late. The fires are burning and the trees are crying. The earth is dying and we have to see that our actions have consequences and there is no earth to be. Conservation and change is no longer for the future of the next generation, but rather for the future of every living organism that calls and will call Earth their home. The fate of our planet and our future lies in our hands. Whether we want to take a firm stance against climate change or sit back and do nothing, it's up to us to move forward as a human race. We have to call attention to what is going on around us and bring forth change and ideas which will benefit us in the future. We, the people, have to fight for what's left of our chance of survival. And if we don't do that now, who knows what might come upon us? Our future, the future of all students and young children out there, are at risk. But we are not going to back down. So with that much pressure on my generation, how exactly can we make informed decisions and advocate about the changing world around us and environmental policies effectively? First off, how can the youth make informed and accurate decisions when there are just so many sources on the internet? Well, it's rather simple. You can follow up on the many organizations and committees whose efforts are directed towards the betterment of the environment online. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the leading international scientific body related to climate change research. Their goal is to provide scientific assessment reports on climate change impacts, future risks, and adaptation and mitigation options. The reports published by IPCC, written by leading scientists all across the world, are the most reliable sources of information on climate change and all international organizations and treats use them in policy making and climate change action. Another very famous one, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. It is known for assessing global, regional, and national environmental conditions and trends and helps in the development of international and national environmental instruments, as well as strengthening institutions for the wise management of the environment. But what if you're looking for more accessible or local organizations? Well, there's always the Malaysian Youth Delegation. It plays a two-part role of representing Malaysia's local youth climate movement and raising awareness of climate policies amongst Malaysians. They are an exemplary organization centered on youth empowerment that translates technical policies into relevant and relatable information for all Malaysians and aims to hold Malaysian leaders accountable for the promises made at international climate summits. Check them, the Center for Environment, Technology and Development Malaysia is also committed to improving environmental quality through the appropriate use of technology and sustainable development and actively addressing diverse environmental issues such as sustainable energy and transport. By reading up on these organizations, contacting them, or even paying them a visit, one can truly understand the impacts our actions have on Mother Nature, as well as the measures needed to reduce our carbon footprint. Secondly, the vast amount of teenagers and young adults who preach about climate change is undeniable. The stand against the climate change movement is widely known to have been started by a Swedish girl named Greta Thunberg, who spent a Friday sitting outside the Swedish parliament with a handmade sign and a message. Climate change is here, it's threatening the future, and the grown-ups in charge aren't taking it seriously. So now I, Greta, will go on strike for the climate. This started the hashtag Friday for Future movement where students all across the globe would get out of their classrooms for even just a second or march through the streets in hundreds 
to push for meaningful action to stop the spectre of climate change that looms over all of our heads. This motivated three teenage girls, Haven Coleman, Israel Hesse, and Alexandria Villasino, to organize 120 climate strikes all over the US on March 15, 2019, to demonstrate their commitment towards bringing attention to what they see, and frankly, what we should all see as a global crisis. But what exactly are those actions known as? Well, the grassroots movement. The grassroots movement is where change and action start on a local level, where the community creates noise and brings attention to what they are fighting for. Those events listed above are excellent examples of how young students, not only teenagers, can play a vital part in advocating for a change in environmental policy. We need to create a discourse large and powerful enough in society that people in power will actually notice our cries of help and do something about it. Aside from those examples, Sister above, how are we so sure that they will cause an impact and bring change? Well, let me draw a parallel here to the gun control laws in America. After the infamous Parker, Florida shootings, as well as the Sandy Hook Elementary School, Thousands of people across different communities have called for stricter gun control laws to protect innocent kids from harm. Never again as a student-led political action committee for gun control that advocates for tighter regulations to prevent gun violence. And it was started by a group of 20 students who attended the school in the aftermath of the 2018 shooting. This garnered lots of attention from nationwide brands such as Time Magazine, and has even prompted the Florida legislature to pass a bill titled MSDHS, Public Safety Act, which raised the minimum age requirement to buy a firearm to 21, while also increasing the hiring of school police. In all, around $400 million were allocated. Whoa! If a student-led grassroots movement can cause a governmental group to pass a bill for stricter gun regulations, why can't we as a nation do the same for climate change? This is a serious issue and we all need to wake up. Now, what about innovation? How have people around the world helped stop the drastic effects of climate change? One of them is Boyan Slats, a 23-year-old inventor who founded the world but ocean plastic cleanup system at just the age of 16. The interceptor is the world's first scalable solution for preventing debris from entering the ocean and has been placed in highly polluted rivers all across the globe, such as in Malaysia, the Netherlands, and Vietnam. Skipping Rocks Lab has also invented edible water bottles, Uhu, that is frozen liquid dipped inside an algae mixture, causing a membrane to form which is totally safe and edible to consume. Aside from that, there are also many organizations which act globally to ensure that they are doing their part to stop climate change, such as the Clean Task Air Force, a, a US-based NGO that's been working to reduce air pollution since its founding in 1996, as well as scaling up on the development of technologies that are crucial for decarbonization but are often neglected by other NGOs and the government. For example, since 2009, has been working on a campaign for tax incentives for carbon capture and storage. Founders Pledge estimates that a donation to this group would convert CO2 carbon dioxide at a rate of $1 per metric ton. Whoa, that is a large amount. The Information Technology and Innovative Foundation, a highly regarded U.S. think tank, runs the Clean Energy Innovation Program. That program looks into smart, clean energy research and development and the effectiveness of increasing spending in that space. Then advice is the most effective. It's not just that. Innovation could be the next stepping stone we need to advance forward. If companies and organizations create a technology that make clean energy at a cheaper cost, it will undoubtedly expand to various countries on the other side of the globe. 
For example, if you bring down the cost of low carbon technology in the US or any other country really, you can make it competitive with fossil fuels in China and India, which fun fact, by 2040 could make up 75, 75% of all emissions. And it's only just two countries. And thus, encouraging the use of clean energy over fossil fuels. So consider donating even a small portion of your allowance or salary for a greater cause. If you can donate a substantial amount to organizations like these, donating even one ringgit can seriously go a long way. You can help pave the way to a wave of innovation with just a tap of a button. This is it. We need to start looking at possibilities and ideas which could benefit us in this gruesome fight against climate change. We need to begin finding ways to rid our air of carbon emissions, to rid our waters of sickening pollution, and to restore the wonders of our beautiful ice caps. We need to make a stance on the globe and demand for what's rightfully ours and of all living organisms on Earth. A future. Ever since the early 1900s, scientists and geologists like Thomas Crowder Chamberlain have been warning us that climate change will be a serious issue. In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned us that we have a comfortable 2030 to then to save the Earth. But scientists everywhere are pushing people in power to do something beneficial for our survivability in just the next 18 months. And as the common saying goes, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. If you don't change your lifestyle starting today, you're only contributing to the downfall of humanity. To all the students and young kids who may be watching right now, what's the point of studying in school for a future that we might not even have? We need to change every single one of us. We have to finish off what we started in the first place. And actually, contrary to most, it's not too late to make a difference. It never is. The war against climate change is a long and brutal one. And there is no option of sitting down and relaxing. Do anything you can in your power to ensure that this moves forward and affects people. Whether it be donating, spreading awareness or supporting or maybe even switching from a plastic bag to a recyclable one. You have the faith of the earth and the future of all living organisms on it in your hands. You have to make the call to change. It's now or never. Together, not only can we help the state of the world recover, but we can improve the lives of millions across the globe. We need to strive for a difference. We want to witness advancement. We deserve better. They deserve better. We are the apex of change. It starts with us. Thank you. All right. That's, that was awesome. Thank you, Sang Jun. And you're right. So accounting for over half of the world population youth is everywhere and you have the power to push for change and for a generation that is so well connected you could use your power um, to empower other youth um, on environmental activism and to put actions and solutions against climate change all right we're going to move on to our final speaker for Sembang at WWF 2020, Aini Akilah Muhammad Asri from IPG Campus Bahasa Antarabangsa. Unfortunately, um, Aini is here in the call with us. Unfortunately, due to a technical difficulty, 
um, she won't be able to go live uh, with us. So we will be sharing a video of Aini sharing her insight on how do we move forward as a society. My name is Aimi Akila bin Mohamad Asri and for today, I'll be giving a talk on how can we move forward as a community. A couple years ago, I have come across an internet analysis video on YouTube and it has introduced the term sustainability for me and honestly has really got me thinking. Environmentalists have started to create awareness on how to live a more sustainable life and I feel that every environmentalist out there probably has your own book on how to live a zero waste lifestyle. The motivations behind sustainability are often complex, personal and diverse, which is why it is unrealistic to create a list of reasons on why there are so many individuals, groups and communities that are working toward this goal. For quite a long time, I have been wondering on how communities from middle class or even lower class families are able to adopt a sustainable way of living with limited accessibility to certain products that promote a greener lifestyle. As we know, developing countries such as Malaysia are yet to have personalized funds to further proceeds of sustainable development. And due to this, it might be a challenge for us as Malaysians to have more awareness on this issue. This concern has brought me to another term, which not a lot of people are aware of, which is intersectionality. Intersectionality argues that there are many multiple aspects to humanity, including race, gender, class, age, body type, and many more. And these aspects doesn't exist separately from each other. They are inextricably linked, meaning that individuals whose identities overlap within this number of these minority classes will face many more challenges in their life. And you might be wondering what exactly are the connection with the intersectionality and what it has to do with sustainability. To be honest, we live in a society that glorifies consumption and people even say that capitalism is at its finest. From the recent article that I have read, millennials in Malaysia spend almost 34% of their income on apparel. And it is undeniable that right now, fast fashion has become a trend among Malaysian. To make it worse, it is not only applied on clothing, but also on household items. And I personally could relate to this. My family was a compulsive shopper and there's nothing that you could say to convince them not to buy, especially when it is on sale, especially my mother. <laughs> For real, trust me when I say that it is very, very hard. And over the years, the amount of clutter and the disorganized mass has accumulated and just so dizzy to just think about. So what exactly is wrong with overconsumption? Well, it takes so much for the value of the things that you really need and the things that you really love. We are thought that shopping and is an act of self-care and, and it is very important for you to think of the cost instead of the quality. However, in the real world, we are the culprit. We keep on accumulating these things and because we bought it at a very low price, we, we tend not to pay much attention to take care of it and instead we just opt to throw it once broken. And fast fashion and climate change are intrinsically linked to colonization. From the food that we consume to the way that we dress ourselves is related with a system of oppression from the hands of those with less and mainly people of color. Now think about where the fast fashion clothes that you lost bought were made. Think of the countries where your food is grown and who is suffering from our buying habits. However, I kind of understand where my mother is coming from because with the amount of hoarding that she does, because we are talking about parents, there is always this concern on how many items that we need to keep and how many items that we have to give away. And that is the great area that we really need to focus on, which is 
why it is very important for us to read up on intersectionality. We we have to look up and search about about equity and sustainability that allows everyone to have the comfort of accessible but also sustainable items. And the reason why intersectionality is important is because of the stigma among society itself. There are many ways on how we can achieve a more sustainable lifestyle. However, you do not need this checklist of items to confirm that you are environmentalist. You do not need that super expensive eco water bottle or that pure handmade cotton just to show your devotion to save the earth. And again, touching on the subject of intersectional tea, we really could not afford to ignore the effect of capitalism, greenwashing, and marketing in today's world. Although nothing is wrong with having these items, it is even more important to be mindful of the things that you you already have and how you and how to utilize it to the full extent. The the abundance of material items in your life can really take away things that really matter inside of your life. So although we have been aware that larger companies are the biggest contributor to overconsumption, individual consumption is also significant. We have to keep that in our mind. Thus, it is very important for us to be mindful of our own consumption. So what can others do to help? First, we need to understand the seven definitions of sustainability, which is to sustain, develop, com eco community, economy, community capital, caring capacity, and equity. These are the seven first steps toward understanding sustainability. And the next step is to understand sustainable development and sustainable community because there are probably as many different definitions of sustainable development and sustainable community as there are many people and communities that are trying to define it. But here's the thing, it is much easier to be said than done, isn't it? I mean, not everyone can afford to have that privilege in spending and buying fresh products or shop in sustainable clothing stores and why can't you just use less plastic? Why don't everyone just use metal straws or, or shop in a more sustainable way? While it may seem nice to be able to afford these local and handmade items, it is undeniable that sometimes most of these products cost a lot more than other less eco-friendly products. Also, we need to take into account of their location, their income, occupation, and many more. Then this is when sustainable consumerism takes place because it is much more than just consuming green. We can, we can start by meeting only basic needs and be responsible with our consumption. Always buy what you need and eat what you buy. These actions can lessen our ecological footprint. On a more general level, I will suggest you to read up on intersectionality and examine the privilege in our own lives. Next, you can surround ourselves with diverse voices so that we can understand and hear the experience of others be quick to listen and approach people with compassion if they live differently to us. Continue to make individual, individual choices, but also look at how we can get involved in collective action and lobbying for better environmental policy. We need to understand that the more privilege we hold in society, the more power we have to make it better. And together, we, we collect all of this energy and something worthwhile to fight for. Though it may seem impossible, it is undeniable how much power of a community can do. If everyone is able to understand their privilege and how much power they had on consuming products, we can, we can and could make changes to allow the same lifestyle for those who are unfortunate. We could also create more awareness and promote alternative products that are more affordable, 
but are also more sustainable. To end my speech, I will end it with a very special quote. Who says a dream must be something grand? Just become anybody. We deserve a life. Whatever big or small, you are you after all. No matter how small your contribution is for a sustainability journey, it is still matters as long as we are still connected. These are the times where we need more care than anger and we need more trust and doubt. Be open and willing to have conversations, even if they make you uncomfortable sometimes. And as what is happening to this world, we need more awareness on this issue. Just like the pandemic that is happening to date, it needs to cross our minds that working together as a community is better than just pointing fingers and finding the fault of others. We have to look at the roots and identify the flaws of our plan in order to collectively take actions, but in our own comfort and suitability of our own background. Just like the lack of medical assistance and masks, we are lacking in efforts and resources to help the sustainable development. So before I end my speech, if you're having second thoughts and doubting yourself, continue to ask yourself, if not me, who? If not now, when? Thank you very, very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Aimee, for that insight. Um, I in our sustainability effort, it is definitely important for us to put ourselves in others' shoes and to see from their point of view on the um, relevancy and also the doability of the work that we do. Um, that being said, that being said, yes, changes start from you, and collectively we can do so much more. Now, before we move on um, to the next part, which is the expert speaker session, um, we would like to get some input from you by answering the short poll. Um, it will probably take about 30 seconds of your time. So if you could maybe provide us with the input and then we could use this in our future engagement um, with you and the rest of the public, uh, members of the public. All right, let's see. I am going to end the poll now. Okay, let's just, I'm just going to quickly share the result. Uh, so most of you would like to know more on social innovation and also on webinars on environmental topics and environmental issues. And you feel that the access and availability of resources is definitely something that we should definitely look into. Um, following the situation with COVID-19 pandemic. We will definitely take this input into consideration when we plan our future events. Um, thank you everyone for your input. All right. Now, um, I would like to welcome our expert speaker for today's session, Ms. Aliyah Abdullah of Malaysian Youth Delegation. Uh, now, Aliyah has a degree in international relations and she is particularly passionate about um, about human rights in climate change. Uh, she speaks more about youth empowerment. Um, everyone, you can head down to our Slido link that is posted in the chat box um, to post more questions for Alia later. All right, so welcome Alia. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today. Hi, thank uh, you for having me. <laughs> awesome. Alia, could you tell us a few words about yourself? Yeah, um, so, well, I started out, you know, being really passionate uh, about specifically uh, human rights and as well about, you know, the environmental challenges that, you know, we see every day on the news. Um, so as a result, I got into international relations uh, as a choice of my degree. And while I was doing my internship for an NGO during uh, this degree time, um, this NGO that I was interning for was focusing on sustainable lifestyle and sustainable development you know that can be promoted with communities and as well as industry players i stumbled across the malaysian youth delegation and it was amazing because so malaysian youth delegation as uh, spoken before by our uh, storytellers you know we focus on 
climate policies as well as educating you know the Malaysian public about policies as well as like challenges imposed you know on our government or on the international communities uh, it, it you know it exposed me to the world of climate science and politics you know as well as uh, UN bodies governments and CSOs and linking these bridges basically um, to you know to get them together and respond accordingly for, uh, to climate change and with all of that that actually landed me a great opportunity to be in Mestec where you know I learned so much more about you know how our government responds to climate change you know through policies and as well as local politics and collaborations and all that all right I think it's particularly interesting that you started out with an internship in an NGO <laughs> and then you really move to something that is much bigger. So that is definitely a journey. A roller coaster. So coming from an activism background yourself, can you maybe share more about your personal journey in climate change activism as a youth yourself? Uh, so, like I said, it's quite a roller coaster. But also, I mean, to sum it up in a sentence, I think it would be intense, but extremely, you know, empowering as well. Because, you know, as youth, when we talk about climate change or when we talk about holding our government accountable or even international communities accountable, there's always this notion that, you know, just because we're youth, we're millennials, you know, we are deemed as an experience and you know, we're being too demanding just because now that we have a platform and, you know, we have that, there's also that assumption around the air that, you know, they say like, we don't, as youth, we don't really know that much, you know, and we're perceived as angry kids with no actual reason, <laughs> you know, so, and that's, that's not true. I, I feel like yes. we're angry kids with substance, you know, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, but that actually was a great that helped with a fantastic learning process you know where we constantly had to like read up on like documents policy briefs um science reports you know and and it was nice that it opened up doors to like um to talk to other fellow, like peers and as well as experts you know having that discussion on you know what is considered appropriate to respond to climate change within you know our our frame as a developing country. So it, it was a constant learning process, that's for sure, which is fantastic, you know? And you know, the part where it's very empowering is that, you know, as you go on this journey as an activist, you know, talking about climate change, you realize that at some point you're going to rally up with other youth and you realize that it's the voices of youth is just impossible to ignore at this very point and you know it is already amplified but it just needs to be amplified further on both like national and also international platforms all right so yeah definitely i mean we can all agree that youth can play a very big role very big Yes. <laughs> yeah. So in, we actually conducted a recent survey um, with the help of UNICEF and we found out that the respondents of the survey, over 93% of them agree that youth does have a play, uh, the role to play in, in climate change advocacy. So as we look into this, in order to get into the advocacy process, they would have to get enough knowledge to make informed decision. Um, how do you, as youth, and how do you tell other youth that they could get the information, enough information they would need to make these informed decisions, to alleviate the worries and the impacts of climate change impacts? Right, so I think, you know, especially like when in MYD, the first thing that we do or the first thing that we tell people when you want to get on board with this journey to you know to fight for a better and more sustainable world the first thing that we always say and remind ourselves actually is that we need to understand what is the local narrative right so what is considered a problem for america does not necessarily mean it's the same problem for malaysia right so Yep. And you need to understand also what is our local challenge and what is our opportunities as well. So that's the first thing. Once you have that foundation set, you know, it's easy 
it will be really easy to understand what comes after this when you want to know more about when you're going to make informed decisions. So once you understand what the narrative is, you mm. move on to something a bit more heavy, but it definitely helps support, which is reading about climate, uh, sorry, climate science. So you have, like our storytellers were saying, you have the IPCC where they, they give out like policy uh, science briefs for policymakers, and a lot of people can actually have access to that on their website and just read more about like the challenges that you face in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, in a certain you know um, climate and stuff like that. So because like you cannot just simply rely on just the media itself, right? I mean, it is not substantive enough, and it's not really on point mm -hmm. in. Sometimes it doesn't address the questions that you may have. So, and to, following to that, you can also read, because a lot of um, organizations, whether they're international and especially even local organizations, they have a lot of um, article pieces that they actually post up on their website or they share around and you can actually get an insight on what they think and maybe mm -hmm. that will support what you have in mind of your decisions, right? And most importantly, I think conversations is definitely needed at this time, whether it's with experts, fellow CSOs, even if it appears, it helps form what you already think. And maybe you can get like a different kind or maybe it adds up to what you have already been thinking about, you know, especially when it comes to like making decisions and trying to advocate, especially. And also to help it out even more, you attend webinars by organization. This is where I shamelessly, you know, talk about NYD since we have our webinars as well, where we talk about a lot of uh, policies. <laughs> we talk a lot about it's science. True, true. <laughs> you know, which is true, which is true. And, um, but I think when you, when, when all this comes down, right, you also need to understand that we need to have that political awareness as well. I think that's really important when you're going through this process as well, because I mean, look at Syed Sadiq, for example, right? He was a youth who became a minister, you know, with informed decisions. And, you know, he advocated a lot of things such as like uh, lowering the voting age. And he was a youth who was doing that. So if he can do it, why can't we, you know? So we just definitely need to come together. And once we like rally up, we definitely have a really big voice that no one can ignore, that's for sure. All right, awesome. So it's about coming together within the narrative, I suppose, instead of um, in issues on advocacy, but what this information to share this information with your family and friends who are not entirely aware of the issues, but would like to know more. How do you say they should approach that? Um, to speak to communities and their friends and family. Yep. <laughs> okay, my number one golden rule is don't be that person who shoves like climate change down other people's throat because climate change is a very heavy subject, right? So when we talk about climate change, you don't straight up say, oh, people are dying and countries are sinking because for some people, that's a bit too much for them to comprehend, right? So you start off with like small things, for example, like you relate climate change to daily lives because climate change now what people think is 15,000 feet above the air, like above the clouds, you know, it's out of this world. They cannot relate to it. And they, some people would feel like really helpless, like they can't do anything much about it, about climate mm -hmm. change. But when you have these conversations, you try to relate it to like daily lives. So you can talk about like the floods that have been has that has been happening for a very long time around coastal areas. You can talk about uh, water shortages. You can talk about, I think my personal favorite would be the weather because you would hear a lot of our folks would say, um, it's too hot. Nowadays, it's so hot. Back in my time, we it was never this hot. In fact, it was so cooling, you know? So yeah. that's where you have that conversation. You just be like, yeah, I think it's because, you know, at that time we had so much of forest and we know that forest cools the earth's temperature, but now because we're cutting it down so much, you actually see the changes. And for them, they feel much, um, oh, Ksenia, you know, why yeah. is our trees being chopped down, <laughs> yeah. you know? 
yeah. because I did that with my mom. So because she <laughs> always complained that it's so hot, right? So when I told uh, her that, I said, you know, trees are being chopped down. So, you know, this is why we've been feeling it like that. So now when she sees like, there's like people from DBKL like chopping down trees, she gets so angry. She's like, don't they know what's happening right now? You know, climate change is so real and they actually, so, you know, that's, that's a great way. That's a great way to start because you want them to know about it first before mm. they can actually have any actions, right? Yep. And what you can do is also in within your capacity is you follow organizations of your choice on social media and you just share out infographics that they have because at this time they would have like a lot of infographics that is very easy to comprehend. And what I personally like to do, uh, this is because like, you know, I'm such a millennial, you know, I like sharing memes <laughs> so much. <laughs> and, <I've, laughs> and there's this page where, you know, he, uh, they, they address a lot of um, environmental problems through memes. And I liked sharing it because I thought it was funny, although it was painfully accurate. But I started noticing a lot of my friends who never had that conversation about climate change before started sharing them as well. And I was just like, wow. Mm this is a bit too easy <laughs> you know but because it's so relatable everyone knows yes. you know some memes and, but you know it gets to them it it brings it brings climate change issue down to the ground and they just be like you know what this is actually so real if we can actually make a meme about it obviously this is like such a pressing issue you know <laughs> yep and also it is important that you know you create the climate change knowledge in local language so that means that when you want to talk about climate change you have to educate yourself first because mm. there's going to be questions coming from different angles different directions that's going to hit you and you have yeah. to be prepared to answer these questions not to say that you have to have everything at the back of your hand but i mean you want to talk about climate change to other people right so you got to have substance when you talk about talk about it Awesome. Um, Alia, we also have some questions from the um, audiences. So if we can maybe ask a few of this, maybe one or two. Um, okay, so the first question is, how can we be more inclusive as a community without leaving anyone behind to take climate action? This is actually a very good question. I think this will be more about collaboration, right? So it cannot be just youth versus the world. It has to be everyone versus the problem. So you need to, you know, not only hold our government accountable, but you also need to talk to industry players as well, because um, I'm not going to touch much about that, but you need to talk to <laughs> industry players as well. You know, you have to get everyone involved in even the community as well. We have to just like get down to the ground and just talk to them because believe it or not, a lot of people know about climate change in terms of problem, but they don't see it as the way we see it as climate change. They mm -hmm. just see it as a current problem like, oh yeah, we have flooding, but we don't really know why or what is causing this, you know? So mm -hmm. when you have more discussion about what entails, what is climate change and you know what entails it to become climate change, I think that already is the first start of involving everyone in the process of getting mm -hmm. everyone together to tackle climate action because a lot of people or most some organ most of organ organization or most communities they do have the answers but they just don't know what is it called for it to be addressed you know mm, yep yeah <laughs> okay so i suppose we can go for one last questions sure. um there are a lot of good questions i can see they are being voted for but yeah let's this one what can the youth do to get their voices heard by the government or any ruling bodies so we're not talking about friends and families now we're talking about the big guys on top yes and this is my favorite question <laughs> 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 so really to get your voices heard by government and ruling bodies it is really just rallying up together and making your voices heard one of the ways actually is through the media so mm -hmm. Um, about two years ago, the Malaysian Youth Delegation, we actually written an article and it was talking about how we should not subsidize petrol anymore because that just, you know, contributes to fossil fuel expansion and, and all that and promoting people to use fossil fuel more. 
And we never knew, but apparently your former minister, Yobin, she picked that up and she invited us to her office. And <laughs> just to have a very intense conversation, uh, but she wanted to know why we think that way. And, and we said, you know, it's, it's not right. But, you know, it helps us have a discussion with them. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to, you, because um, arguments does not typically resolve anything. It helps raise this concern. Yep. It helps Correct. amplify what the problem mm -hmm. is. But at some point, mm -hmm. you have to work together in order to solve the issue. So, mm -hmm. you know, going out to the media, going out to the streets, you know, getting in touch with them. They're, actually, they're actually quite reachable. You can actually just send them a message and someone will definitely respond <laughs> to you, you know? They are, okay. like, our government is re easy going. So is the orga international organization or any ruling bodies as well because, you know, we're all in this together. So collaboration is definitely much needed. So you can definitely approach and either come up with own solutions or amplify whatever other organizations or um, communities that are doing to help uh, tackle climate change, you know, amplify their voices and get them heard as well. And mm -hmm. it's definitely one step to working together. All right, awesome. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Alia, for spending your precious time with us today. And it's been a pleasure. We would like um, to um, invite everyone to share whatever that you have learned and gained today with others. So use the power of your social media and yes. follow us on our <laughs> WWF My ESD uh, to check out on our campaigns and the work that we do. So come together and let's be part of the solution to the problem that we have created in the first place. Now, with that being said, before we wrap up our final simba at WWF today, let's do a quiz just to see how much you have gained and understood today's content. Let's see. Okay, so you can either follow the link that is on the slides being shared right now, or you can click the link shared on, in the chat box. So hopefully this will help us do better in our future engagement with you. All right, so if you could maybe make your way to quizzes and play the quiz that we have prepared for you based on today's session. Uh, congratulations to those who have uh, took part with the quiz. Um, don't stop learning about the issues here. Um, definitely read more. As Alia mentioned, talk more to people. And once you do, we hope that your knowledge goes beyond awareness. Um, we will be sharing with you um, Alia's, um, how you can reach Alia's if you have um, further questions. But before we end today's session, um, we would like to request for everyone to turn on your camera so that we can take a group photo, a digital group photo. Is that okay? Can we have everyone to turn on their camera? No? <laughs> Come on, WWF team, turn on your camera. Yes, St. June is here. Anyone else? Yes, Alia is back. <laughs> All right, let's see. Okay. Anyone else want to turn on your camera? No? Farah? Jonathan? Hi, Dino. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> All right. Do we have some more people before we take the photo? No? Okay. All right. Sophie, yes, maybe you can start snapping now. <laughs> okay, look at the camera, everyone. <laughs> awesome. You got it, Sophie? All right, awesome. Thank you. Okay, let me just share with you my final slide for today. Right. Um, thank you for joining us for today. We really appreciate that you taking some time off your Saturday um, to join us and our storytellers and our expert speaker. Uh, if you would like to know more about what we do, uh, please visit our websites at this um, 
address that is on the slide. Um, Aliyah can be reached via Instagram for MYD. Um, you can send email to MYD as well. So there are a bunch of people like Aliyah in MYD and they would be able to answer the questions, any concern that you might have in order to get, or maybe if you want to be a part of MYD, then you can uh, talk to them and see how the process goes. So you can email Alia also at her email that is available on the slides. Um, in the meantime, again, thank you for joining us. We hope that you have gained as much as possible that you could have. Um, we look forward to your support in the future as we plan to have more events and programs um, on, on environmental education. Uh, thank you again. Oh. And have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, Mazalina. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, bye, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.